changes dramatically, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that we can come to your word and receive eternal principles that you really can't find anywhere else. So I do pray, Lord, that you be with us today as we study your word, both in Sunday school and and in the main service that follows and in all the Sunday school classes that are meeting now, even as I speak. We do specifically pray for the illuminating ministry of the Spirit of God, whereby he comes alongside and gives us an anointing to learn all things. So we take that promise very seriously, Lord. We are in need of it. And in preparation for that ministry, we're just going to take a few moments of silence to do personal confession before you, not to restore our position, but broken fellowship, if need be, so that we can uh, receive uh, today in an unhindered way from the Spirit of God. We're thankful, Lord, for the promise of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. We're thankful for the new month of the year. We're thankful for the Lord's table. We're thankful for the fellowship lunch that will follow. And we just ask that you would have your way here at Sugarland Bible Church. If people need relationships, we ask that you'll provide them. If people need understanding, we ask that you'll provide it. If people need encouragement, we ask that you'll provide it. If people need correction, we ask that you'll provide it. Only the mind of an omniscient God can see into the hearts of your people and know exactly what they need. And I pray that, Lord, not just for the people gathered in the building, but for anybody that's listening or watching online or archive after the fact, that you would use our time today in your word to meet the deepest level of need in your people. And anybody that happens to be watching or here that is unsaved, we do pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said. Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open them to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2 and verse 15. As you know, Paul the Apostle, planning that church there in Thessalonica, up there in the north on his first missionary journey. Uh, excuse me, second missionary journey, uh, being pushed out of that area down south into Corinth by the unbelieving Jews. The same unbelieving Jews that persecuted Paul are now persecuting the Thessalonian church. So it's there he receives information from them that they need, the Thessalonians related to confusion that they were under. And part of the confusion um, compounded with persecution was that they thought they were actually in the day of the Lord, which is the tribulation period. And you see that there in chapter 2, verse 2, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by spirit or message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So they had received this letter, forgery, allegedly coming from Paul, saying that the day of the Lord has come. And so people get confused when they receive letters from people that aren't from the people that signed the letter, right? And I don't, I don't know, maybe this is a good segue into this. I don't know how these people do it, but they, they now have my email and they have my communication information via text. 
So if you get an email from me asking for money, it probably isn't me. And if you get a text from me uh, wanting a personal appointment with you, <laughs> that probably isn't me either. So I was just talking to someone that says, was that you that texted me? And I said, no, it wasn't. So not that I'm comparing myself to Paul, but I'm just saying that it confuses people when these forged, forged communications show up. So that's what the Thessalonians were under. They, got, they thought they got a letter from Paul saying, you're in the tribulation period. And then they were being persecuted by the unbelieving Jews. So, boy, we're in the tribulation period, Paul says, and we're undergoing persecution, so we must be in the tribulation period. Paul had taught them that they would be removed from the earth via the rapture before the tribulation period starts. And this forged letter comes in and says, no, you're in the tribulation period. So if that's true, if this forgery is true, then how do you trust anything Paul said ever? Because he just contradicted himself, allegedly. So what Paul does really at the heart of this letter, and this is the section of Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians that's most well known is he gives them five reasons why they're not in the tribulation period. You haven't seen the departure, which is a synonym for the rapture, as we've taught it. You haven't seen the Antichrist in the temple, which is a prophesied event. You haven't seen the restrainer removed. We explained that. You haven't seen the Antichrist overthrown by the breath of his mouth and the splendor of his coming, Jesus, and you haven't seen the destruction of the lawless one's followers, verses 10 through 12. So as you look at verses 10 through 12, it really paints a negative picture of people in the tribulation period following the Antichrist. He says in verses 10 through 12, and with all deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they, notice he switches from we to they. So this is not describing the church in the tribulation period. This is describing the earth dwellers in the tribulation period. Who perish because they do not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they, notice the pronoun there, may all be judged who do not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. And then look at verse 13. But, it's a contrast. But we, see the switch from the they to the we? So I'm really glad I'm a we and not a they. <laughs> Because the they is the people in the tribulation period, but the we is members of the church that will not be in the tribulation period. So in contrast to the they, he now says, well, what are we like as the we? You know, as we are eagerly awaiting for the return of our Lord, what, what should our lives be like? And so what he does there in verses 13 through 17, and I think we started this last time, is he contrasts the destiny of the righteous, that's us, with the destiny of the earth dwellers in the tribulation period. And as we close out this chapter, he gives a thanksgiving for their calling. We saw that last week in verses 13 and 14. Then he's going to give them an exhortation to stand firm, verse 15. And then he prays that they would have something which we all need, um, which is strength, verses 16 and 17. I actually prayed the Lord for strength today. Kind of woke up this morning and I didn't know whether to say good morning, Lord, or good Lord, it's morning. We were out a little, last, a little late last night celebrating our daughter's graduate for graduation from high school. So let's give her a round of applause. 
She didn't know I was going to do that to her, so sorry about that, Sarah. But it's a big deal in our family's life. And so a little bit tired today and asked the Lord for some strength. So Paul here is exhorting them to stand firm, verse 15, and he's praying for their strength. And he's no longer talking about the they, he's talking about the we. So notice what he says here in verse 15. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15. So then, brethren, so it's clear he's talking to Christians now. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. So after calling them brethren, he exhorts them to stand firm. Now, why in the world would they need to stand firm? Because they've just been sent a forged letter that's throwing them into a state of deception. So he's exhorting them to stand firm against spiritual deception that they're under and being tempted with and to say no to spiritual deception and to go back to the traditions that he had taught them when he planted the church in Thessalonica on missionary journey number two. And obviously they needed this because if you go back to verse two, they had been shaken that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed by either a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So the word for shaken there is the same word used elsewhere. Acts 16, for example, of an earthquake. So a theological earthquake had gone off in Thessalonica because they got this letter from Paul contradicting everything Paul taught them earlier. And that threw everything uh, up in the air. How do you trust anything Paul says? And what he exhorts them to do is not pay attention to any communication that they allegedly received from Paul that contradicts what Paul had taught them earlier. Go back to the traditions I taught you. And anything that contradicts it, you would reject. And so that's how you stand firm as a Christian. Because we're living in an age of spiritual deception. In fact, when Paul spoke of the end, the latter times, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he specifically warned of spiritual deception. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, but the Spirit express, explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. In other words, as we get closer and closer to the end of the age, the amount of spiritual deception people will be under will increase. And when we are confronted with teachers, preachers, books, YouTube videos, whatever, that contradict apostolic doctrine, like the pre-tribulational rapture, we are to reject those communications and go back to the ancient traditions, the apostolic traditions. And so that's what he is exhorting the Thessalonians to do. And by way of extension, that's what we're to do as well. Why reject a letter that says you're in the day of the Lord? Because he told them earlier, you're not, you're not going to be in the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, he clearly taught them to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, he says, For God has not destined us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, in other words, he said at least two times in the first letter, you're not going to be in the day of the Lord. You're not a candidate for divine wrath. So when they get a letter allegedly coming from Paul saying, you're in the day of the Lord, obviously instead of being overwhelmed by a theological earthquake, you just compare the communication with what Paul originally said, 
and you reject the false communication. And that's basically how you live as a Christian. Because there's all kinds of people out there telling you all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the Bible. In fact, a lot of the things they say go directly against the Bible. And so what do you do as a Christian when that happens? You reject what you're hearing and you go back to biblical truth. And so that's how you stand firm in these last days in an age of deception. And by the way, you can't really do that very well if you don't know what the original instruction book says, right? So the more familiar you become with the authentic, the more you can reject the counterfeit. It's the analogy that's used to explain this of the world of finance where they teach people how to recognize counterfeit money rather than showing them every vestige of counterfeit money, they become familiar with real currency. You know, it's, it's texture, it's color, uh, and so forth. And you're so familiar with the real that when the counterfeit goes across your hand, you can immediately sense something is wrong. That's how the Christian lives in an age of deception. You're so familiar with the truth, you're so familiar with the New Testament, Old Testament, apostolic doctrine, that when you hear something that isn't right, you can kind of recognize it's not right. It, it really is not possible this day and age to become an expert in every kind of false doctrine that's out there. You could probably spend your whole life becoming an expert in one area of false doctrine. If you wanted to study Mormonism and why that's false, you could spend your whole life doing that. If you wanted to study Islam and why that's false, you could spend your whole life doing that. And the truth of the matter is nobody has time to do that. I mean, nobody has time to become an expert in one area of false doctrine, let alone the countless false doctrines that are out there. But what you can do is you can become familiar with a finite revelation that's only 66 books. You can become familiar with that. And, th and therefore, when you run into false doctrine, you may not know every little thing about that false doctrine, but you can recognize it immediately as false doctrine. So that's what the Apostle Paul is telling the Thessalonians to do. And by the way, this is the purpose of coming to church, one of the great purposes. A church exists to equip God's people so that they are not swayed by the false. This is why God put spiritual gifts into his church, including the spiritual gift of pastor teacher. He says, Paul, later on in Ephesians 4, 11, verses 6, 11 through 16, he gave some as apostles and prophets, that's the foundation of the church, Ephesians 2, verse 20, and some as evangelists, those are people that are gifted in winning the lost to saving faith, and some as pastors and teachers. And the Greek there is essentially the office of pastor teacher. Granville Sharp rule. Definite article, followed by two nouns, joined by a conjunction making the two nouns equal. So there are pastors, and then there are teachers, but there's a specific gifting called the office or gifting of pastor-teacher that God specifically put into the body of Christ. For what reason? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints and the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to Christ. So the office or gifting of pastor-teacher is the ability to teach the Bible in a way that's understandable and relevant. And as you're sitting under the teaching of the Word of God and being a good Berean, and making sure the pastor teacher is teaching according to what God said, what is happening is you are being 
edified, built up, and equipped in an age of deception because you're being brought to spiritual maturity. As a result, verse 14, we are no longer children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. So that's what was happening to the Thessalonians. They were being swept away by the trickery of men and false doctrine. And really what they needed in their midst is to go back to apostolic tradition and they needed somebody within their assembly to be raised up with the gifting of pastor teacher to fortify God's people in Thessalonica so they wouldn't be swept away by this doctrine or that doctrine and sort of carried about by the trickery and deceitful scheming of men. And he goes on here and he describes what mature Christianity looks like. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ. Now, now a church cannot bring its members to maturity by just preaching the same message over and over again. Uh, there are so many churches that are confused on this where they think the function of a church is to be kind of like a soul-winning station and to preach the gospel over and over again. Now, we, we do give the gospel here at the close of every Sunday morning message, minimum, because there might be people here or listening that are unsaved. But if that's all I did every single week, a John 3.16 message, that, that has no value to those within the church that have been saved for years. I mean, you're already saved. You don't need to know how to get saved over and over again. An evangelist preaches the gospel message. The pastor teacher teaches the full counsel of God's word. Because as you're moving through the full counsel of God's word, you're getting all of your food groups supplied to your spiritual diet, right? You're getting all of your vitamins. And as you're getting all of your vitamins, you are becoming more and more mature. As you're becoming more and more mature, you now have the ability to look at all of the false doctrines out there and not be swept away by them. So our church here is focused on primarily the teaching of the word of God to God's people. I am really not an evangelist. There are many times I wish God made me into an evangelist because I do have a heart for the lost. But God never gave me the gift of evangelism. What, what he told me to do is you're a pastor teacher, use your gift. And then he said, do the work of an evangelist which we try to do by giving the gospel to the unsaved at the conclusion of every Sunday morning service minimum. But that's not the primary thrust of Sugarland Bible Church. If that were the primary focus of a church, then it really isn't a church. You would call that an evangelistic crusade, an evangelistic rally. You would call it something other than a church. But the purpose of a church is to bring, and it's right out, right out of Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. You can see I'm not making this up. It's to bring God's people to maturity so that they're in the big, bad, nasty world out there are not constantly swept away by false teaching. Verse 16, from whom the whole body being fitted together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each, each, each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building of itself up in love. And I emphasize each there because the ministry does not belong to the pastor teacher. The ministry belongs to God's people. You see that back in verse 12 of Ephesians 4. After describing pastors and teachers, it says, for the equipping of the saints. 
for the work of the ministry. So a lot of people have this idea of the ministry is you pay some guy up front to do the ministry. And that's not um, a biblical understanding at all. The ministry belongs to each member of the body of Christ. All of us within Christ's body play different roles. Some are ears, some are feet, some are hands, because God has gifted us all different ways. And so the purpose of church is for the pastor teacher through the teaching of God's word to equip God's people. And they carry on the work of the ministry. And so if that's not happening in an assembly, then what is happening to that assembly is they're being swept into one form of deception after another. I mean, the poor people during the week, um, as they're looking at social media or watching things on TV, or the kingdom of the cults is knocking at your door, not if they come, but when they come. Very nice looking people, by the way, on bicycles. Um, carrying a Bible and maybe some other books that supplement the Bible. <laughs> I mean, how, how in the world are you supposed to stand up against that kind of deception if you're not being equipped in your local church? And so what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians is you need to get back to basics. Verse 15, so then brethren, stand firm. And what else does he say here after he calls them brethren? So he's clearly talking to believers here. He's talking to the we and not the they. So then, brethren, stand firm. Now watch this. And hold to the traditions which you were taught. So go back to tradition. Now tradition is tricky because sometimes in the Bible, tradition is a bad thing. Jesus critiqued the Pharisees because they were using their tradition to set aside the word of God. He says in Mark 7 verse 13 to the Pharisees, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition. Notice this, which you have handed down. So this isn't God's tradition, you Pharisees. This is your tradition. God didn't hand it down. You handed it down. And you do many things such as that. So they were in a habit, a lifestyle, many things of using tradition to set aside God's word. Now, the specific context here deals with the fifth commandment, honor your mother and father, you know, helping your parents in their old age, basically, is what it's talking about which is a normal expectation that God puts on his people. You know, you know, if your parents in their old age are <laughs> infirm or in lack, you don't just, you know, leave them there to die. You try to assist them any, any way you can. Fifth commandment, honor your mother and father. Well, what they were doing here is they had a tradition, and you don't find it in the Bible. It comes from the Pharisees, called Korban, Korban is the idea that you give money to the Lord. It's like an additional offering unto the Lord. So they were saying, Korban, Korban. We gave all our money to the Lord, to the temple. We don't have any money left to help our parents. And Jesus chimes in here and he says, you're using tradition, Korban, which comes from Pharisaical tradition, to invalidate the fifth commandment is what he's saying here. So there's a clear example where tradition, if it goes against the Bible, you don't jettison the Bible. <laughs> you jettison the tradition. And a lot of us come out of, myself included, um, high liturgical type services. The Episcopalian church is where my roots are. And in hindsight, there was a lot of things that they were doing, like praying for the dead uh, a number of other things I could mention here. Kind of bringing in um, what are called the apocryphal books. So we didn't have 66 books. We had a, a lot more. 
bring in the apocryphal books, uh, sort of practicing a mild form of transubstantiation at the Lord's table, where the elements, as we're going to celebrate today, a little later, are not just remembrances of what Christ did, but they kind of contain some kind of mystical or spiritual power in and of themselves. Uh, Roman Catholicism teaching that the elements are not memory devices, but that's the actual body and blood of Jesus. So Jesus is re-crucified over and over again every single Mass. So those are examples of traditions that go against the Bible. And when a tradition of man goes against the Bible, you reject the tradition of man, right? And you stick with the Bible. So not all tradition is good. Tradition can be very, very negative. And because a lot of us come out of liturgical environments, high church environments, where there's tons of tradition, once we get exposed to biblical truth, we start to take on an attitude that all tradition is evil. You know, if it's traditional, throw it out. <laughs> um, and notice what Paul is saying here. Tradition can be very helpful. It's, it's just where does the tradition come from? Does it come from the Pharisees and their man-made regulations? Or does it come from the apostles? So here's an example where the apostle Paul says tradition is fine. In fact, he's exhorting the Thessalonians to go back to apostolic tradition. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught. So you look at tradition and you don't take an attitude of it that it's evil and it's wrong because it's traditional. You look at it and you say, well, f from where does it, where, from whence or where is this tradition derived? If, it's, if it comes from the Bible, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it at all. The problem is when you get involved in practices that go against the Bible, then the tradition becomes negative. And so how would you ever tell if a tradition that Christians are utilizing or employing or celebrating, how would you, be, how would you ever be able to tell if it's good or bad? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because if you look at verse, the end of verse 15, he tells you exactly how to recognize it as good or bad. Because tradition in and of itself is not necessarily good and it's not necessarily bad. He says, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. In other words, if the tradition comes from us, it's okay. Now who's the us? The us is the apostles. And you might look at that and say, well, that's the most arrogant thing I've ever seen. I mean, how, how could Paul say, honor a tradition if it's word of mouth or by letter from us? I mean, how could Paul say something like that? Well, he could say something like that because he was an apostle. And an apostle was a conduit of divine revelation. So he had every right to say what he just said here at the end of verse 15. If a tradition is by word of mouth or letter from us, then it's okay. And Paul says, I can say that because I'm an apostle. I'm a conduit of divine revelation. And unless you understand Paul here speaking as an apostle, that God was using at this particular time in history to lay down the foundation of the church, Ephesians 2 verse 20, some of the things he says com seem completely outrageous. That's why a lot of the feminists, you know, look at Paul and will say something like, well, who does he think he is saying something like that? Well, he could say it because he was an apostle and apostles can say stuff like that. Now, if you said it, or I said it, it would be outrageous, right? But Paul can say it because he was an apostle. So you might remember all the way back in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, Paul made this statement. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, 
which you have heard from us. You accepted it, not as the word of man, but what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. So Paul, in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, says, When I speak, God is speaking. Now, here at Sugar Land Bible Church, you're not going to hear your pastor teacher get up into the pulpit and say that. I'm not going to say that when I talk, God talks. What I will say, though, is when we are faithful to apostolic teaching, God can speak to you in that sense by way of application through a sermon. But no human being has the right to say ever since the canon of Scripture was closed... 2,000 years ago, that when I talk, God talks. But Paul could say that when I talk, God is talking because Paul was an apostle. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 7, it's very interesting as Paul is outlining instructions for divorce and remarriage. You know, he'll, he'll say things like this. Here is something that the Lord says, but not I. And he'll say, now here the Lord is talking. And he'll go back and quote Jesus. And then in that same chapter, he'll reverse himself. And he says, now here's something not the Lord is saying, but I'm saying. In other words, what he just did there is he put his words on equal par with Jesus. Which is something that an apostle can do. In fact, Jesus himself in the upper room said that would happen. Jesus in the upper room would say, I have many things to teach you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he, the spirit, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will bring things to your remembrance. That's the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He will teach you all things. That's the epistles. Paul wrote, what, 13? And then we have eight general letters written by the apostles. And he will tell you the things that are to come. That's the book of Revelation. So Jesus himself, and it's a kind of a different way of thinking because we have all of those bumper stickers and license plates that say, what would Jesus do? You know, we kind of look at Jesus as the final authority on everything. Now, we have to be very careful here. There is nobody like Jesus. There will never be anybody like Jesus. He is the monogenes, the unique one, the eternally existent second member of the Trinity. So in that sense, he's the ultimate authority. But Jesus himself never said, okay, uh, there's no other truth after me. He specifically in the upper room says the Spirit's going to come. He's going he's to remind you of all things, Gospels. He's going to teach you all things, Epistles. And he's going to tell you about the things to come, the book of Revelation. Because I could do this for you, Jesus says, but you cannot bear it now. So Jesus himself never claimed to be the final and total authority of biblical truth. And unless you understand the development of the New Testament that way, the things that Paul is saying here, when I speak, God speaks, will seem completely out of bounds. Paul could say that because he was an apostle and Jesus said that would happen. So you take Paul's words... And you have to put them on par with the words of Jesus Christ himself. And that's an answer to a lot of the feminists who just write off Paul and say, well, he was a, you know, a chauvinist pig. You know, he didn't know anything. I'm following Jesus. You know, I'm a red letter Christian. You heard of that? Uh, I'm just following Jesus. I don't, I don't really care about what Paul and the apostles said. They were a bunch of you know, homophobic bigots anyway. I'm just a Jesus-only type. Well, that, that, that type of mentality betrays a misunderstanding of what Jesus said would happen. 
where Jesus didn't claim to be the total, complete uh, uh, authority of all divine revelation. Jesus, only thing he said was, I planted some seeds that the apostles are going to come along later and water and bring to fruition and bring to fulfillment. Um, you'll notice that the New Testament is set up this way. For example, notice 2 Peter 3, verse 2. Peter says that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets, Old Testament writers, and the commandment of the Lord and Savior, that's Jesus, spoken by your apostles. So there the apostle Peter took the apostles and the prophets and he put them on the same level. And then in that same chapter, 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16, Peter, who wrote under divine inspiration, starts talking about the things Paul was saying under divine inspiration. And Peter says this, And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. So Peter is saying, my words are on the same authority as Jesus, because I'm an apostle. And Paul, his words are on the same authority as my words. And Jesus' words, because he's an apostle. But then Peter adds this interesting comment, 2 Peter 3, verse 16. As also in all his letters, speaking in them of things in which some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So Peter here says, Paul is writing with the same divine inspiration as me, and I'm writing and speaking with the same divine inspiration as Jesus. But I'll have to be honest with you at the end of the day, Peter says, some of the things this guy Paul is saying are hard to understand. Notice he doesn't say impossible to understand. He says they're hard to understand. Now why would Peter say that? Peter says that about Paul because Paul was unfolding the mystery nature of the church. Um, Paul was the apostle, Galatians 2, verses 7 through 9, to the Gentiles. Peter was the apostle to the Jews. So Peter talked a lot about concepts that a Hebrew Christian would understand. Paul was talking about concepts that a Gentile Christian would understand. Where in the age of the church, believing Jew and believing Gentile are in one new man called the body of Christ. Now that's a, that's a new idea. That's a, that's a Gentile sort of idea. Peter, who was focused on the Jews, thought that some of that stuff Paul was saying was not impossible to understand, but it's hard to understand. But even though it's harder to understand from the Jewish frame of mind, he clearly states that when Paul is developing these ideas in the book of Ephesians, for example, Romans, other books, that he is writing with divine wisdom. Uh, another great verse on this, because it's, it's easy to find New Testament references telling you that the Old Testament is inspired. It's harder to find New Testament references telling us that the New Testament is on the same level as the Old Testament. Because the New Testament was just coming into existence at the time of these writings. And I only know of a few scriptures that do this. 2 Peter 3, 2, which I already gave you. 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16, which I already gave you. Another one is 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Paul writing to Timothy says, The elders 
who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. And I say, thank you, Lord. That's for me. I appreciate that. Then he says, for the scripture says, and he quotes two scriptures, and he calls both scriptures scripture. Now that's very interesting because he's quoting an Old Testament scripture, as I'll show you in a minute, and he's quoting a New Testament scripture. One is from Deuteronomy, one is from the Gospel of Luke, and Paul is taking both Old Testament, Deuteronomy, New Testament, Luke, and calling them both scripture. See that? He's putting the New Testament writers on the same level as the Old Testament writers. That's what he's doing. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox. Now, I don't know if I appreciate that very much. I don't like being called an ox. But anyway, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Now, that's the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25 and verse 4. And he calls it scripture. Then he says, and, conjunction. The laborer is worthy of his wages. Now that's Luke 10, verse 7. So right there, Paul took Luke and took Deuteronomy and said both are scripture. But both are inspired by God. So this is how you make sense of these things that Paul is saying here. When he says, go back to the traditions. Don't, don't fall for these phony emails and, and texts and, and, and forgeries. Go back to apostolic tradition. Well, Paul, we don't really like tradition. We think tradition is evil because we're Protestants. Paul says, well, don't go that direction. Don't throw out all tradition. Tradition can be very healthy. Well, how do I determine if it's healthy or unhealthy? Because Jesus clearly said some tradition isn't healthy. Paul says, here's how you know, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. If the tradition is anchored in apostolic truth, then it's fine to follow. Well, Paul, where do you get off putting your words on the same level as Jesus? Paul says, well, I can do that because I'm an apostle. And if you study the upper room very carefully, you'll see Jesus even told us this time period would come. And so that's how we treat our New Testament. You know, this is one of the big problems with these red letter editions of the Bible. I mean, I, I get it. I like the red letter editions because it's like Jesus is talking. I better pay attention. And then when you get to a non-highlighted section, it's like, okay, Jesus has finished talking. All right, what a relief. I can <laughs> mentally take a break, you know. And so we think that way. But we shouldn't think that way because Jesus himself said, when the apostles start to write, because I'm going to bring to your remembrance, the Spirit is. I'm going to bring to your remembrance all things. I'm going to teach you all things. And I'm going to tell you the things to come. I can't tell them to you now because you can't fully comprehend it. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will do all of those things. He will bring them to your remembrance, gospels. He will teach you all things, epistles. He will explain the things to come, the book of Revelation. And when those apostles start writing that stuff, everything that they're saying is not kind of a footnote to what I've told you. You put it on the exact same level as to what I've told you. And in fact, if you study it very carefully, you'll see that what these apostles are doing is giving full coloring, full flowering, if you will, to the seeds that I've planted, uh, particularly here in the upper room. So look at that. We finished a verse. Praise the Lord. Now he prays for their strength. He, he thanks God for their calling, verses 13 and 14. He exhorts them to stand firm, verse 15. And now he prays for their strength. Look at verse 16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us, 
and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, verse 17, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Now, as you look at the beginning there of verse 16, notice the different members of the Trinity that are involved in this prayer as Paul is praying. He says, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, that's God the Son, the eternally existent second member of the Trinity, and God our Father. That's the eternally existent first member of the Trinity. One of the things to understand is all members of the Trinity are involved in your salvation. All members of the Trinity are involved in your spiritual life. That's why when Paul is praying for the strength of the Thessalonians, he's not just making an appeal to one member of the Trinity, he's making appeal to all members of the Trinity, or at least two. God the Father and God the Son. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit all share in the full essence of deity. In fact, we can go through Bible verses that, that tell you the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And by the way, folks, living in the Sugarland area, you better learn this real quick because this is a rapidly proliferating Islamic population here. And of all of the doctrines that they, do, they disagree with us on, it's this. They call us the three God Christians. They completely and totally reject the Trinity. We embrace the Trinity because we believe it's a biblical concept. The Son shares in the full essence of deity, as does the Father, as does the Holy Spirit. But the Father is unique in his fatherness. The Son is unique in his sonness. The Spirit is unique in his spiritness. So the Father is not the Son in terms of personage. The Son is not the Spirit in terms of personage. The Spirit is not the Father in terms of personage. Yet they all share in the same essence of deity. You say, well, Pastor, can you explain that a little bit better? No, I can't. That's about as best as I could do. I mean, it obviously is something that comes way outside of our time dimension to, to even have this revealed. But that's the biblical presentation of the triunity of God. So when Paul is praying for the strength of the Thessalonians, he's making an appeal to the various members of the Trinity. Now, Peter, when he gives his opening salutation in 1 Peter 1 verse 2, does the exact same thing. He mentions all the members of the Trinity and their involvement in our salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, it says, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Hey, I have grace and peace with God in the fullest measure because all members of the Trinity executed what they were supposed to execute in my salvation. The Father foreknew me. The Holy Spirit sanctified me. The Son sprinkled me with his blood. So notice that they're all involved, but we don't learn from that that this radical unity, Islam, that they're all the same. They're not. They're different. They're not different in terms of the essence of deity, but they're different in terms of function. So when the Son submits to the Father and says to the Father, not my will be done, but thy will be done, as Jesus prayed at Gethsemane, when he took his will and subverted it to the will of the Father, when Jesus did that, he was not relinquishing one iota of deity. 
Because I can show you passage after passage after passage where Jesus claimed deity. What was happening there was not a surrender of ontology, which means value. It was, though, a, submi a submission of function. It is what is called functional subordination. He submitted in terms of role, not in terms of value. And when you're talking to the Mormons, if you don't have this straight, they will tie you into a theological pretzel almost overnight, almost in a nanosecond, because they will say something like, well, you think the Son and the Father share the same essence of, of deity, then why did the Son submit to the Father? And the answer to that is it was a functional subordination, not an ontological subordination. And if you come back like that, they'll say, um, I think we've got another house we need to go to. <laughs> and they may mark your house and not come back. By the way, when they come to your door, the guy talking is the trainee, right? He's being trained. The guy in the back that's usually a little bit more quiet, sometimes older, is the trainer. So when you start to ask your questions of Mormonism, aim your questions at the guy that doesn't know as much and just ask some simple questions. Like, get if they're Jehovah's Witnesses, you can get into the subject of Jesus was a created being. That's what they think. They think there was a time in which Jesus was not. He's created get into the subject of, well, then why did Jesus say things like this? Abraham saw my day and was glad. I mean, why, why did he, why does it say in the book of Colossians that he is the creator of everything, if he's a created being? And you don't have to have a conversion. All you have to do is their, their mind works a certain way, okay? It's like a, it's like a wheel on a bicycle. It, it flows a certain direction. All you need to do is take a metal rod and put it into the spikes. And suddenly their mind is not, wait a minute, I'm learning something that I didn't know before. And don't, don't get mad at them. These are souls for whom Christ died, right? And then you just pray that the Holy Spirit would take the seed that was planted, which is the metal spike into their spokes. I'm speaking metaphorically, right? Because they are on <laughs> physical bikes. And you're just dislodging something which interrupts their thought process because they've been taught a certain way. And then as the conversation ends, you just go back into your house and say, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to share. I don't have to have a conversion. All I have to do is plant a seed and I just pray that the Holy Spirit will take that seed and water it and bring this soul for whom you died to salvation. And you don't know who God is going to raise up next to take that seed and water it further. And as you pray that, I think in the afterlife you'll learn that because you took the time to do that, um, they'll say something to you like this in heaven when, if and when they get saved. Boy, you know, what you said on the porch, um, that's been, that bothered me for a long time because I didn't have an answer. And even the guy training me didn't have much of an answer. But you know what? The Lord took that and watered it, and I eventually became an authentic believer in the Lord Jesus Christ because of a simple seed that you planted. Uh, what, what does Paul say? I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. It's agricultural. So if, if you're not the person on the other end, that we all want to see the growth and the conversion, but God may not call you to that. God may call you just to plant the seed. Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Although they were on different parts of the agricultural process, 
um, Apollos and Paul were on the same side. They just play different roles in farming, which is analogized to evangelism. And ultimately, if a conversion happens, it's ultimately because of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So, I thought I would finish uh, chapter 2 today, which I did not. So, maybe we'll finish chapter 2 next week. What do you think? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your truth, grateful for your word, grateful for how it speaks to us. Help us to have an attitude of gratitude as we... Remember what you did for us 2,000 years ago as we participate at the Lord's table today. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Happy full intermission.